I'm Caitlin Hernandez from LAist, and my event series, Queer LA Live, is back, celebrating wellness with movement, meditation, and joy. It's on November 30th. Get your tickets now at laist.com slash events. LAist Studios. We are the occupants of our schools, and we know what changes we want to make. This is How to LA, the podcast that helps you navigate this city and maybe make some changes along the way. I'm your host, Brian De Los Santos. Today, we're talking about the heat and how it affects school kids. And just for some context here, the day we taped this conversation, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, the temperature in L.A. was around 80 degrees. 80 degrees in late November. It's cooled off a bit, but the heat has lingered a little too long this fall. Yes, it has. It's been very hot this summer and fall. That's Erica, Out of LA's associate editor. You know, we're, we're impacted by climate change. And researchers I've spoken to have said the heat will last longer into the school year. So you've been looking into this and specifically what it means for students in the Los Angeles Unified School District, right? Yes. More than a year ago, LAUSD announced that it was going to put in more green space, focusing on more than 600 schools that really have very little. Most schoolyards are covered in asphalt and concrete. There's been a lot of talk, but I wanted to check in on what's actually been done. A final plan is expected soon, but there's still a lot of questions, Brian. Okay, we're going to get into LAUSD schoolyards plan in just a bit. But I have to say, when I first heard about your reporting, I was shocked that after so many years, schoolyards are still covered in asphalt. My elementary and middle schools were in the mid-city area, and they had little student gardens, but very little grass or trees. Yeah, I agree with you, Brian. Same with me um, and my experience going to L.A. schools. Basically, most public schools are not designed for the kind of extreme heat we get nowadays. To understand how it got that way, let's go back to the late 19th century to early 20th century. You know, I love history. Mm -hmm. America was going through a period of rapid growth. I'm talking about the Industrial Revolution and urbanization. As more people started to drive cars on the road, asphalt became an essential part of the American city's landscape. It was a smoother roadway for cars. It was fairly easy to make and it wasn't that hard to maintain. So as more schools were going up to handle the baby boom, asphalt was used on playgrounds and schoolyards as well. It probably seemed smart at the time. Mm -hmm. But decades later, schools are in need for serious upgrades. These are old buildings and many still don't have AC. And there's been this growing realization that all that asphalt might not be good. Asphalt absorbs heat and that makes the surfaces where these kids play kickball really hot. Yeah, let's talk about the heat problem. We talked to LAist reporters and experts about this issue. Our region is only getting hotter and hotter. What have you learned through your reporting? So even though the weather is cooling down now, the fall semester has still been very hot. Let's take schools in the San Fernando Valley, for instance. The temperature in those students' neighborhoods can hit highs well over 100 degrees during different parts of the school year. The asphalt in the San Fernando Valley has registered 142 degrees on its surface. That's hot. Yeah, (laughs) I can't even imagine. Here's UCLA researcher V. Kelly Turner talking about how bad the extreme heat we're facing right now has gotten, especially for the kids. One of the things is that this year is hot. It was a hot summer. It's going to continue to be hotter further out into the school year. And that's just going to be how it is in the future. Some people call that the quote unquote new normal. And so it's um, important to think about heat in the fall because it can be 100 degrees here in Los Angeles in November. In her team's research at UCLA, they found that schools are some of the hottest places in communities. Researchers estimate that 60 percent of California's elementary school districts will experience at least 100 days above 90 degrees annually by 2035. And you also spoke to students and teachers about green spaces in their schools. What did you find and what did they say? I talked to a third grader at Beachy Avenue Elementary School, which is in the San Fernando Valley. He told me that he likes to be outside to play, but his schoolyard is missing some shade. It's really hot out here. Sometimes I've experienced like heat waves and my feet like burning even though I have shoes on. 
A number of students and other stakeholders also weighed in during a recent Greening and Climate Resilience Committee meeting, a forum LAUSD started to publicly address these issues. Here's another student named Arthur. He's in high school. We are the occupants of our schools, and we know what changes we want to make. This includes implementing more green spaces, gardens, or shaded areas with natural covering. This could create a much more desirable environment. As our input and voices are heard, we can work together with the district to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Luca, Also, an elementary school teacher from San Pedro said something pretty shocking about what her students experienced on their playground. She said there was crumbling asphalt everywhere. She said the play area looked more like a prison yard than a school where students should play. My school is not on the top 30 most critical asphalt repair list. How many more schools are like mine that are in dire need of repair but years away from getting improvements? We have to take a break, but we'll be back to continue talking with LA's associate editor, Erica Washington, about the lack of green space in LA schools. Thanks for listening to this LAist Studios podcast. Can I tell you about our news site? It's LAist.com, and it covers news, culture, and happenings that matter to Angelinos, like how and where to get your vaccine, how Southern Californians are fighting for racial justice, local and state politics, and how you can still take part in our vibrant food and art scene. We're working hard every day to bring you local news you care about. I hope you'll check it out. LAist is true LA stories powered by you at LAist.com. Thanks for listening to another great podcast from LAS Studios. I'm Suzanne Watley. And since you obviously like hearing stories that help you engage more with your world, join me every weekday for NPR's Morning Edition. Starting at 5 a.m., we get you the day's breaking news stories, local, national, and worldwide, and give you a little joy and delight to start your day right. Morning Edition, weekdays from 5 until 9 on the radio at LAS 89.3 and on the LAS app. So let's talk about learning and how this heat issue affects kids in the classroom. Research shows that heat can negatively impact kids' ability to learn. It hinders their academic performance. One report from the National Bureau of Economic Research found that kids who took the PSAT on hotter days had lower scores. And this was much more pronounced in lower income communities that tend to not have AC or much green space. Here's V. Kelly Turner again. So maybe there's a child who doesn't have air conditioning at home. And then maybe they walk to school in a neighborhood that doesn't have trees or building shade. And then they come to school and they also have very little access to shade, maybe no cooling inside. Their core body temperatures are never getting down to safe levels. And that's going to cause them to have difficulty concentrating. And it's going to be very, very hard for a child to learn in that context. Imagine, Brian, when you're burning up on a hot day, it's hard to focus, right? Mm -hmm. So if the heat can make us adults irritated, think about how it impacts the little ones who need to be outside. But we also know that being outside in nature has tremendous benefits for everyone. And other studies have found that students benefit from time spent in green spaces. It's like when we go out for a walk in the park and get some sunshine and we feel so much better afterwards. Let's dive a little deeper. And can you explain what green campuses are? In short, think of a park or a garden or a forest. But for a school campus, it would be a patch of grass or some trees that provide shade over a play area. Even shade structures count, anything that can cool down outdoor spaces. Experts, advocates, and parents want schools to simply be more natural spaces and have shade so kids are cooler. The air is not only cooler with natural spaces, but cleaner. It's not only good for kids' mental and physical health, it's good for communities. So what's LAUSD's plan to fix all of this, since obviously people want this to happen? In June of 2022, district officials announced it would put $58 million towards outdoor education initiatives, including greening. A few months later, then-board President Kelly Ones authored a resolution calling for Superintendent Alberto Cavallo to develop a plan to ensure school campuses are at least 30 percent green. But Gones says she's still waiting. We need a systemic approach from the district. It requires like a really significant transformation in most cases because just the way that the playgrounds have been set up, it's not aligned to the 21st century environment our kids live in. 
All right, Erica, I have to ask, why has all of this been so hard to pull off? In short, Brian, time and money. The district has raised about $500 million in funds for school improvements through Measure RR, grants, and other non-bond sources. But district officials say they need $4 billion to green 600-plus campus sites. Officials say that they may need to rely on bonds, which will require voter buy-in. Mm-hmm. Also, maintaining natural surfaces takes manpower. So the district officials have to plan and staff for that. Bureaucracy when it comes to guidelines for playgrounds and schoolyards can be a barrier, too. Here's V. Kelly Turner with a little bit more insight. You know, it's not just about planting trees. It's about correcting the policies that make it really hard to do no-nonsense things, like erect a shade structure over a swing set. That should be something that a school can easily implement, but it actually ends up being quite difficult based on the rules and regulations around facilities construction. Turner also pointed out that heat governance is at its infancy right now. So a lot of legislative things that are coming down the pipeline are experimental and new. Figuring out how to budget them is still an issue. But some of the ideas, she says, are not that expensive. And you spoke to folks at elementary school that were able to create green space on their campus. How did they pull it off? Yes, there are schools that are pulling it off through district projects, nonprofit partnerships like the Trust for Public Land and Tree People. Some school officials have reached out to board members for funding. I talked to the principal of Beachy Avenue Elementary School, who told me she made the call to her board member, Kelly Gomez, to create a reading garden. But, Brian, that took five years and more than $100,000. That's kind of a long time. Yes, it is. So I have to ask you this. If there's such a lack of resources to create and maintain green spaces in schools, Does that mean those community gardens or other cute features that are on LAUSD campuses are the work of community members themselves? Some are. For example, I wrote last year about my old elementary school, Wilshire Crest, and how it was so asphalt heavy. They wrote me back saying that the campus, which used to have more than 11,000 square feet of asphalt, now has a reading garden and green space. Two members of the parent organization there, sometimes called the PTA, made it happen back in 2008. They raised money, wrote grants, and worked with the school to get it done. There are a lot of stories like this, but it often requires the community to make it happen. Moms, dads, grandparents, or just people who care often have to make the time to get involved. And some schools just don't have the resources. So let's say if I were an LAUSD parent or someone who wants to start pushing for a greener campus, what do you suggest I do? You can actually work with your school principal on starting a green effort if there isn't one already. I would also suggest that you attend a school district greening schools and climate resilience committee meeting if you can. At those meetings, you can meet advocates and talk to board members about the work that's being done in your school or how to start it. You can find out about it on the school board's website. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Erica. I feel like I learned something and took me back to elementary school, Brian. That's cute. (laughs) It did for me, too. That's How to LA Associate Editor Erica Washington. You can read more about green schoolyards at las.com slash how to LA. That's it for us today. And catch you mañana. This episode was produced by Monica Bushman. Our How to LA team also includes Erica Washington, Evan Jacoby, Mangy Botel, and Victoria Alejandro. Our intern is Tony Morales. Our executive producer is Megan Larson. And our engineer is Hasmik Pagosian. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Imagine if you could charge your electric vehicle at the places you already love to eat, shop, and play. Whether you're at the movies, on your weekly grocery trip, or running errands at your local mall, Volta EV charging stations are built around your day-to-day and located in your community and nationwide. All you have to do is check in, plug in, and go about your day. It's EV charging made convenient. Download the Volta app to find your new favorite place to charge.